And welcome back to Conversations of Great Minds. I'm speaking with renowned religious scholar Saeed Hossein Nasser, prof uh, professor of Islamic studies at the George Washington University here in Washington, D.C., and uh, author of numerous books. The Essential, Saeed Hossein Nasser, is one of my favorites. There's uh, you, you, you're in the Heart of Islam, another. Um, President Obama recently spoke out about some of the violence that's happening in the Middle East, particularly in Syria and Iraq right now. Here's what he had to say. Let's make two things clear. ISIL is not Islamic. No religion condones the killing of innocents, and the vast majority of ISIL's victims have been Muslim. And ISIL is certainly not a state. It was formerly al-Qaeda's affiliate in Iraq and has taken advantage of sectarian strife and Syria's civil war to gain territory on both sides of the Iraq-Syrian border. So there's this kind of spectrum of fundamentalism. We see it in Christianity in the United States when it gets violent. In mostly it's been things like murdering abortion clinic doctors. Um, in the Middle East now, after this, uh, after uh, I call them Bush's wars, uh, we see some real disasters happening and it seems a spiritual disaster as well. What are your thoughts on, on what is happening there and how Americans perceive it? Of course it's extremely saddening for me as a Muslim to see this happen within the Islamic world as I would be saddened to see it happen in the army of God which is Christian in Kenya killing 10,000 people right. and it's not unique to Islam. You also find it in Gujarat when 3,000 Muslims are massacred and have Hinduism you find in Myanmar, Burma today, where, as you know, the Muslims are being massacred right before your eyes. But Islam uh, especially uh, paid attention to for several reasons. Uh, first of all, within the Islamic world, Islam is still very strong. And so everything that's done is done in the name of Islam. Like in medieval Europe, everything that was done was done in the name of Christianity. All the wars were fought in the name of Christianity. It was not the fault of Christianity, but because Christianity was strong. And so everything that happened in the Islamic world, people in the West who want to attack Islam always say this is part and parcel of Islam. Islam is no more violent than any other religion, and it's as merciful and, uh, as other religions. It believes in the love of God and living peacefully. The word Islam itself means peace. But this phenomenon has occurred, and in order to understand it, we have to understand it historically. Had Islam become completely weakened, like Buddhism became in Japan, for example, the reaction would have been very different. But the uh, colonial experience, followed by all kinds of economic and political pressures, and followed by the drastic and tragic war in Iraq and several other Islamic countries, caused the rise of this fundamentalist reaction, whose theological roots are in the Wahhabi Salafi branch of Islam. But most Wahhabi and Salafis are very peaceful. You cannot blame them all for what is happening, but I said the theological rules are there. And these people make use of the name of Islam and some slogans and some verses of the Quran taken out of context. In order to uh, change the situation, they think for, the, for themselves or to gain power or all kinds of things, and they're doing a great deal of harm to Islam in two ways. First of all, they provide a very good excuse for enemies of Islam, either in the West or in the rest of Asia, against Islam itself. And secondly, they're doing a great deal of harm to Muslim people themselves. They are the victims. And the people are getting killed in Syria and Iraq and Pakistan and Afghanistan and God knows where. They are the first victims. So when people in the West think about these tragedies, they should think that, first of all, the victims are Muslims themselves. And, and in the United States, the, the, the Muslim community in the United States, I believe it's, a, it's about 2% of our population. It's about six, seven million people. The Pew Charity Trust and figures are completely wrong. Uh -huh. Between six to seven six million to seven Muslims million. in the United which is, States. Which is substantial. Yes, about the same size as Judaism. Really, that's, that's a Very consequential close. number of people. That's, that's right. Um, how do you see, you, you mentioned how Buddhism uh, was corrupted in Japan. It, it became basically the state religion, did it not? Along with Shintoism. Shintoism yeah. was a state Shintoism. religion was supported by Buddhism. Yeah. Men, not completely. Many Buddhist monks were against this nationalism, militaristic nationalism, right. but some sided with it. Right. Um, do, you, do you see, how do you, how do you see Islam 
forming and developing in the United States? How, how is it being practiced? Are there fault lines? Are there areas of conflict? Are there areas of coming together? Are the Sunnis and the Shias hanging out with each other? I mean, yes. They, uh, there is an epiphenomenon, of course, in the United States of this extremist form of Islam that you see in the Middle East and elsewhere, but it's extremely small. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of Muslims in this country belong really to the mainstream now of American life. Mm -hmm. There are thousands of them are doctors, engineers, lawyers, businessmen, and very successful in the field of medicine. It's incredible. They're taking over in some places, like mm -hmm. great Jewish doctors did a generation ago. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so most of them are not really to be uh, judged according to what some crazy people do in Syria tomorrow morning. And they have opposed it, they have opposed it very strongly. And they're sinking their roots quite well in this country. It's not part of the landscape. First of all, the problem is that American history was marked with an opposition whenever a new religion came around. Going back to the Quakers, going back to the coming of Catholics in the 19th century to America, you know, all the anti-Catholic feelings that were there then. Then the coming of the Jews, the anti-Jewish feelings, and now it's the turn of Muslims, you might say. Yeah. That will take some time. I'm not worried about that. Islam will become like Judaism and Catholicism before it, sooner or later, a part of the mainstream mosaic of American life. Yeah. Uh, but there is a second factor that's involved, and that is there's all this attack that has been made by certain forces causes the Muslims always have to be on the defensive, uh, defending the obvious all the time. But despite this, there's a very good relationship between most Muslim mosques and Christian churches and uh, Jewish synagogues. Mm -hmm. A lot of amity, a lot of brotherhood and sisterhood, a lot of showing, sharing of meals during Ramadan and during holy days of Judaism and Easter and Christmas. And it's remarkable how on the human level, there's wonderful uh, camaraderie that is going on. And also intellectually now, there's more interaction. Until now, the Muslims have not been intellectually effective in this country, even in defending Islam. But now that's changing a great deal. We have a large number of Muslim scholars who are professors of Islamic studies in the United States, which is a very good sign. Mm -hmm. I'm very favorable to the fact that most scholars of Jewish studies in America are Jewish. That's how it should be. Most Christian scholars should teach Christianity. And now this happened in the case of Islam. That's going to change the scene a great deal. And so I'm very hopeful about the future of Muslims in America. And moreover, the Muslims in America play a very special role globally. Because with new means of communication, if yours truly writes an article here, next week is in Jakarta. It's not just sitting here in Washington and writing. And so the, what the Muslims do here has a tremendous effect intellectually upon the rest of the Islamic world. Because the freedom they have here to express certain ideas, to discuss things, which unfortunately in many Islamic countries is not possible different kinds of censor, different kinds of governmental control, and so forth and so on. In the, in the 1930s in the United States, during the Great Depression, it was acceptable in mainstream media to demonize Jews. Uh, Anti-Semitism was sweeping the world. Uh, we, we had uh, Charles Lindbergh out. He wasn't of going off against the Jews, but he was defending Adolf Hitler, and, you know, who was... And that, that has passed. We now have, it seems to me, and uh, maybe I'm misperceiving this, uh, but we now have a time when it's acceptable to, in some ways, uh, similarly characterize Muslims, to, to characterize them as, as the boogeyman, as the people who are responsible for our problems, as the people who represent a threat to us, as those people apart, all the, all the stereotypes that are applied to Jews in the 30s. In the United States, I see this in it, largely in right-wing media, the be afraid, be afraid stuff. How does, as a, as a Muslim, how do you and how, how do the, the, the people in the Islamic community that you know react to that? What does that do? First of all, I want to tell you, I lecture widely in the United States in many universities. I've never met this opposition. It belongs to a small group of people who are very vociferous. They don't comprise the majority of American people. No matter how much, be afraid, be afraid. If you have a Pakistani neighbor next to you and uh, you're kind to him and he's kind to you, this kind of propaganda doesn't have much effect. But it does have effect in certain circles. Of course, it saddens me because there have been a few unfortunate incidents here and there. But by and large, the very effectiveness is aggrandized. It's true. It is true that the Muslims have now taken the place of their cousins, that is the Jews, in the 1930s and 40s in this country. I agree with you. 
but not to the same extent, because there is no Adolf Hitler around. There are little Hitlers here and there, but not Adolf Hitlers around. And so to praise that kind of demonic uh, attack against the religion, a figure like that, fortune does not exist. But there are smaller groups, less influential people, and they unfortunately do oftentimes say very unfortunate things. The future of all religions, I believe, are tied together. You cannot demonize a religion. I don't mean certain individuals, but the religion itself, without ultimately demonizing your own religion. And I believe that the destiny of all religions are tied together. And most of the important problems of the world, from the greatest problem, which is the environmental crisis, I believe, to the questions of poverty, of war, and so forth and so on, all of these, Christianity and Islam, should be on the same side and also Judaism. Put aside the question of Palestine and Israel, that's a local question, that's a very important one, but it's not global. But the global issues that are involved, the three monotheistic religions, and even Hinduism, Buddhism, all these religions, the best they can do for themselves even is to create accord with other religions and try to face these problems together because we do face all these problems together. Yeah. All people who believe in the spiritual reality are really in the same boat in a world which challenges that reality. Well, and in the minute we have left, does that lead us back to this idea that the thing that can save us, not to be too salvationistic in my language, is resacralizing the world? Absolutely. There's no possibility of our salvation in the theological sense and even in the physical sense without the resacralization of nature and without the realization of the sacred in the other, without not only in ourselves, and the acceptance of the authenticity of the great religions of the world. I've guided people over the millennia. And this Christians need to do it, Muslims need to do it, Hindus need to do it, we all need to do it. Yeah. This is a very, very important task before us. If we do not succeed, everything else will fail. To see the sacred not only in each other, but in all of life yes, and all of yes, creation. Yes, in every tree and in the sky and in the mountains, and not to destroy God's creation for short time purposes of profit or interest. Yeah. You, you wrote the de the step-by-step -step desacralization of knowledge that characterized European intellectual history from the Renaissance onward, beginning with the order of nature, was beginning to affect even theology. It's brilliant. Dr. Nasser, I'm sorry we're out of time. Thank you so much. My for great pleasure, sir. Great having Bye. you. Thank you.